Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you to Family Research Council. My name is Bethany Demin, and I'm the Student Interns and Lectures Coordinator here at FRC. Uh, I'm not sure about you, but I know for me, uh, June 26, 2015 uh, was a day that I won't ever forget. Um, I don't think it's hyperbole to say that everything changed on the day that five unelected judges legally changed the definition of marriage here in the United States. Today, we're going to talk about what has changed, more importantly, what remains the same and what we do and how we move forward based on those facts. Before I introduce our guest speaker, I just wanna hit a couple of housekeeping items for you. Uh, just a reminder to you that we are filming this. In fact, I wanna welcome our online viewers as well. Uh, we will archive the videos of our lectures on our website. In fact, all of our lectures are archived there. And I wanna encourage you here and at home to go ahead and share those videos on your social media. We find that greatly increases our reach. So. Um, with that, I want to move on to introduce our guest speaker. Ryan T. Anderson is the William E. Simon Senior Research Fellow in American Principles and Public Policy at the Heritage Foundation and the founder and editor of Public Discourse, Ethics, Law, and the Common Good, the online journal of the Witherspoon Institute in Princeton, New Jersey. A graduate of Princeton University, he er earned his PhD in political philosophy from the University of Notre Dame. He has worked as an assistant editor of First Things and was a Robert Novak Journalism Fellow. His writings have appeared in many publications, and he has made appearances on many major news networks. Ryan's new book, Truth Overruled, The Future of Marriage and Religious Freedom, is the first to respond to the Supreme Court's decision on same-sex marriage. He has drawn on the best philosophy and social science to explain what marriage is, why it matters for public policy, and the consequences of its legal definition, redefinition. Excuse me. I think we can all agree this sort of thoughtful engagement is essential to this debate, and we are grateful to have him with us today. Would you help me welcome him? Great. Uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, thank you to the Family Research Council for uh, hosting me this afternoon. Um, I kind of had some prepared remarks for what I had wanted to say, and now that we've um, are kind of in the middle of the Kim Davis situation. I, I kind of thought it would be appropriate to kind of start with, with that and then back up into the book a little bit because um, what initially in inspired me to start researching and writing this book, um, to have it ready to go right when the Supreme Court issued its ruling, whichever way that ruling uh, turned out, was I thought that regardless of what the court does, we're going to have all sorts of questions that need to be resolved. And for people who believe the truth about marriage, it's the union of a man and a woman, uh, we're going to need to be equipped uh, to engage uh, those debates and to respond to those challenges. Uh, and so one of the first things that I think about the Kim Davis situation is how did we arrive at a moment in which uh, she was faced with the choice of either do your job um, or quit your job or go to jail? Um, it seems like there was a fourth option there of accommodation. Uh, accommodations. Uh, America has a long history of accommodations. And uh, why wasn't Kentucky uh, in a place where they could create an accommodation here? It's because they had already voted to define marriage as the union of a man and a woman. The Supreme Court, Kentucky was one of the four states that was at uh, the Supreme Court back in June. And the Supreme Court overruled their marriage law. Um, so they weren't able to democratically arrive at a compromise solution, uh, which is why Kim Davis ended up in court um, arguing partly under the Kentucky Religious Freedom Restoration Act that she had a right to both keep her job and keep her faith and to be uh, accommodated if there was a reasonable accommodation uh, possible. And that's the nature of the Kentucky RIFRA. It says there needs to be a compelling state interest that government's pursuing in the least restrictive way possible. It's not clear what the compelling state interest in having her name or her title or under her authority the marriage license is going out. That's the argument her attorneys were making. So let me um, back up from there, because um, to a certain extent, I think that the marriage movement in the United States in a very similar place that the pro-life movement was uh, 42 years ago. Uh, in January of 1973, uh, the Supreme Court overturns all of the abortion laws in this nation. They strike down all of the laws protecting unborn children. And so the question became, what does the pro-life movement do in response? Some people said, well, the pro-lifers have lost. The issue is settled. Um, there's now a constitutional right to abortion because the Supreme Court says there is a constitutional right. And whatever the Supreme Court says is the final word on an issue. Um, and the pro-lifers just lost. They should pack up and go home. Uh, we know that's not what happened. 
uh, we know now from hindsight, 42 years later, um, that my generation is more pro-life than my parents' generation. We know that there are more pro-life groups today working to defend unborn children than there were 42 years ago. We know that more pro-life laws have been enacted at the state level in the past decade than in the previous three decades combined. And we know that we're on the verge of Congress passing a national uh, law that would protect children at 20 weeks uh, gestation. Um, what is it that made that progress possible? Right, so on the one hand, I don't want to, th we, 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 the pro-lifers, we haven't achieved everything that we've sought out to achieve, which is every child being protected in law and welcomed in life. But on the other hand, we shouldn't overlook the real progress that the pro-life movement has made in the past 40 years after a bad Supreme Court rule. Um, so when I was researching and writing this book, I was thinking, what has the pro-life movement done well, and how can we learn from the pro-life movement uh, if we want to respond to the marriage ruling? So let me uh, uh, suggest three lessons from the pro-life movement. I'll um, briefly go through some of the arguments in the book, and then I'm going to try to save the last 15 or so minutes uh, for your questions. Um, so the first lesson that I see in the pro-life movement is that pro-lifers have never accepted Roe v. Wade as good constitutional law. Uh, from the very beginning, their argument was that Roe v. Wade is judicial activism, and it's judicial activism not because we don't like the result. Uh, that's not what made it an activist decision. What made it an activist decision is that it had no basis in the text or the history or the logic or the structure of our Constitution. Uh, the U.S. Constitution is silent on whether or not there's a right to kill an unborn child, and so unelected judges shouldn't have just created a right to abortion. Uh, extending a supposed right to privacy to extend to killing an unborn child. And pro-lifers uh, have consistently said this is bad jurisprudence. It gets the Constitution wrong. It gets the dignity of the unborn child wrong. And we have not allowed the court to have that last word. And little by little, pro-lifers have chipped back on this. Uh, the success of the Born Alive Infant Protection Act, the success of the partial birth abortion protections, and hopefully, uh, this is probably the next case that'll be at the court, it'll be a 20-week bill that eventually, whether it's a heartbeat bill or fetal pain bill, at some point we'll keep hopefully chipping back on the bad precedent that the court has given us. Um, probably one of the most visible signs is every year on January 22nd, about half a million people come to Washington, D.C. in the bitter cold and the snow and the ice. It's the worst time of the year to be here, precisely to bear witness to the dignity of unborn children and to show that the court got it wrong and we're not letting up. The marriage movement needs to say something similar. The Obergefell ruling um, is not serious constitutional law. It doesn't even pretend to be. Uh, if you read um, Justice Kennedy's opinion, um, he's simply espousing his view about what marriage is and then saying the due process clause of the 14th Amendment somehow requires all 50 states to embrace Justice Kennedy's philosophy of marriage. Um, the problem with this is that the U.S. Constitution doesn't answer the question, is marriage a gendered or a genderless institution. Um, the four states that were before the Supreme Court made good arguments for why it's reasonable for voters in their states to vote to define marriage as the union of a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, a mom and a dad. Uh, they made good arguments to say, look, the Constitution neither requires nor prohibits this vision of marriage. It neither requires nor prohibits the genderless vision of marriage, that it's just two consenting adults. Where the Constitution is silent, we, the people, retain authority in our system of constitutional self-government to make policy. And so the primary problem with uh, Kennedy's majority opinion is that it's not engaged in uh, jurisprudence. It's not engaged in constitutional law. It's engaged in social policy making. Uh, they're making marriage policy from the bench, uh, where they have no constitutional warrant to do so. And so this is very similar to what took place in Roe v. Wade uh, on the abortion issue. They were making abortion policy from the bench when there was no constitutional warrant to do so. I think the four dissents, if you read through these incredibly well-written, well-argued uh, pieces of legal reasoning, um, saying, look, it doesn't even matter what we as the four dissenting justices believe about marriage, what we think the ideal policy would be, because that's not the question before us. The question before us is, do the citizens in the 50 states have constitutional authority to decide marriage policy for themselves? And we get four different um, ways of answering that question in the affirmative. And so one of the things that I do in this book is I go through, it's the third chapter of the book, I go through, here's what Justice Kennedy said, here's why Justice Kennedy's wrong, here's why the four dissenting justices are right, you know, here's what they said, and also, here are the arguments they make. 
um, because unfortunately, Kennedy never responds to the arguments that the four states were making uh, to defend their laws. Um, the four dissenting justices make those arguments. Kennedy never responds to them. And so this is a tragedy for democratic constitutional self-government. Um, it's a ju judicial usurpation of politics. The, the third chapter of the book is titled Judicial Tyranny. Um, this is what happens when we, the people, don't make policy for ourselves, but unelected judges make policy with no foundation, no justification in the Constitution. So the first step is simply to remind the public of that, um, that judicial activism has negative consequences. They don't uh, settle issues. They spark culture wars. Why is abortion politics so divisive in the United States in a way that it's not? in many European nations, we haven't been able to work out common sense uh, uh, abortion policy in a way that a, a nation like Germany has. You know, we have some of the worst uh, abortion laws in the entire world. Uh, we're one of the five nations that allows late term abortions in the company of China and North Korea, precisely because of uh, the monkey wrench, the short circuiting of the democratic process that the Supreme Court engaged in. Why repeat that mistake on the marriage issue? And now we're seeing some of those consequences uh, in the person of Kim Davis. So that's step one, is that we just need to uh, um, remind people that Anthony Kennedy doesn't get the last word about marriage. Uh, he got the Constitution wrong. He got marriage wrong. The second step, though, and this also brings us back to uh, Kim Davis, is we need to protect our freedom. We have to protect our rights to live in accordance with the truth about marriage. Um, and this is vitally important. Um, think, uh, for me, I can't uh, just remember it. I actually had to do the research to discover it for the first time. What was it like in the mid-70s, late-70s, early-80s uh, in the American political debate surrounding abortion? Um, some ideologues and some activists on the left were saying that every doctor, every hospital, every nurse, every insurance plan should be forced to perform and pay for abortion. And their argument went something like this. Abortion is a constitutional right. The Supreme Court just said this in Roe v. Wade. Abortion is health care like any other health care. Therefore, every doctor, every nurse, every hospital, every health insurance plan should have to cover abortion. What they were trying to do is say that there's no religious liberty right. There's no conscientious objection right. There's no freedom for pro-lifers. If you want to be a doctor, you have to do abortion. You want to be a nurse, you have to do abortion. You want to be a Catholic hospital, you have to do abortion. Thankfully, the pro-life movement won that debate, and the extremists on the pro-choice side lost. Um, it's precisely because of the victories in the late 70s, early 80s that were made that protected the rights of pro-lifers to be doctors and nurses and to run hospitals and to uh, uh, have insurance that honors their convictions. We're in a very similar situation today. Because you can imagine what would have happened back then uh, had the pro-lifers lost and the activists and the ideologues on the left won. It would be a situation in which it's very hard uh, to be a conscientious uh, evangelical, Catholic, Jew, Muslim, Mormon, and be a professional in the medical uh, profession. Um, they're now trying to do that on the marriage issue so that you can't be a clerk you can't be a, a, a marriage counselor, a therapist, a psychologist, a psychiatrist. You can't be a baker, a florist, a photographer. They're trying to say that you're going to have to leave your beliefs at the door um, if you go into any of these occupations, including charities like adoption agencies and possibly even schools. What did the pro-life movement do? They appealed to the good sense of honorable, reasonable liberals that the activists and the extremists and the ideologues were wrong. So what they did was they appealed to the uh, reasonable pro-choicer to say, I understand we disagree about abortion, but do you need the government to force me to violate my beliefs? And the honorable, fair-minded, reasonable liberals said, no, um, you know, I'm pro-choice, but I don't think the government should make a pro-lifer pay for abortion or perform abortion. We need to do the same thing on marriage. We need to reach out to people who disagree with us about marriage, um, but who aren't the activists and the extremists, and who are willing to say, even though I disagree with you about marriage, I don't think the government should coerce you. I don't think the government should penalize you. I don't think the government should be issuing several thousand dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars in the case of the bakers in Oregon because of your beliefs about marriage. Which leads to the third thing, because how is it that we do that? Um, we do that partly by defending the substance of our belief about marriage. 
Um, so the third lesson to learn from the pro-life movement is that you can't just retreat to saying the court got it wrong and now I want religious liberty rights. You also have to make the case for your underlying conviction. And so in the case of the pro-life movement, it was making the case for life. And they did this in a variety of ways. They appealed to the natural law, to good philosophy, to good science. They used ultrasound. They used uh, new discoveries in embryology and developmental biology. Um, they've used undercover videos. They've, especially most recently, these videos um, from Planned Parenthood. They're graphic, um, but they communicate very immediately uh, the wrong of abortion. You know, the the heart that stops beating because of abortion. Um, They've made it in both using theology and philosophy, um, using faith and using reason, a variety of ways to make the case for life. The same thing needs to happen on the marriage issue. Uh, and here I think there are some people who say, well, let's just stop talking about what we believe about marriage. Let's just protect our rights on marriage. I think you can't do the latter without doing the former. And I'll give you a, a illustration of why. My average classmate at Princeton uh, was a pro-choice liberal. Uh, they disagreed with me about abortion. But they were willing to respect my rights to be a pro-life citizen in the United States. Uh, and it would go something like this. They would say, I think Ryan's wrong about abortion, but I understand why he believes what he believes about abortion. I understand why he thinks the unborn child has a right to life. And precisely because of that, they were willing to say the government shouldn't force Ryan to pay for abortion or perform abortion if I were a doctor. My average classmate at Princeton still doesn't really understand uh, why I believe what I believe about marriage. Um, and because they don't understand what I believe about marriage, they're less likely to respect my freedom, to respect my rights, to act on that belief. And here's part of the reason why. The way this debate has taken place in the United States uh, for the past um, decade or so has been that most of the airtime at the media, I think this has been a media selection factor, has gone to uh, Westboro Baptist Church style arguments. Um, so if you're a producer, um, you're booking people, unfortunately, very frequently, those sorts of arguments got the majority of the airtime. And you even see this in Justice Kennedy's opinion. He doesn't engage the actual arguments that the states made. I was in the courtroom during oral arguments. Uh, the attorney who was representing the state of Michigan did a wonderful job. I've read all the court documents that were filed in the Supreme Court case. There's a reason why they won at the Sixth Circuit Court. They won at the Sixth Circuit Court because they did a really good job defending their laws. All of those arguments were ignored by Justice Kennedy. You can't find a single spot where he actually engages. There's one paragraph where he engages with a straw man uh, a paraphrase of the argument the state made. And that's even the only attempt at responding to their arguments. Um, and so here's the challenge uh, for viewers and for people in the audience today is that if you were a secular liberal and all you knew about people who were in support of marriage of the union of a man and a woman is the phrase, God hates fags, how would you view them and how would you want the government to treat them? And so the, our challenge is to make sure that people hear our voices, hear our arguments, that we speak for ourselves. Because um, I think if we go silent, if we say we're not going to speak up, we're not going to defend the truth about marriage, someone else will. And the someone else who is defending it may not do a very good job at it. I don't think the Westboro Baptist Church speaks for anyone in this room. I don't think they speak for any of the viewers online. And yet if they're the ones who are uh, being, being understood as the representative for the entire half of the country, that supports marriage as a union of a man and a woman, it's not surprising that culturally we get these bad outcomes. So what motivated me to write this book was to be uh, an instruction manual, kind of a, a, a guidebook, a, a how-to, uh, you know, what do we do now? Um, and so the first couple of chapters just do a philosophical exploration of marriage. I'm going to leave the theology and the biblical studies to people who are trained in those disciplines. I'm trained in political philosophy. So just thinking about why is it that up until 15 years ago, every political community throughout human history viewed marriage as a union of male and female? You know, what is it that the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans, that Jews, Christians, and Muslims, uh, that Enlightenment thinkers like John Locke and Immanuel Kant, Eastern thinkers like Gandhi, they disagree about so much. They disagree about things philosophically, theologically, politically. Why is it that they all thought marriage was about uniting male and female? 
Uh, and the first couple of chapters just simply try to elucidate what they were getting at, because they each get at it in their own political traditions, in their own historical moments. Uh, I come at this from a perspective of Aristotelian philosophy. There's a little Aristotelian jargon in there, but I try to make a public argument about this, that it's based upon human nature. And because it's based upon human nature, there's a reason why we see this truth of marriage more or less being articulated and lived out, for better or worse, with greater success, with less rigor, depending on time and place, all across the globe, all throughout human history. It has something to do with uniting a man and a woman as husband and wife so that any children that that union produces has a mom and a dad. It's based on an anthropological truth that men and women are distinct and complementary. It's based on a biological fact that children deserve both a mom, or biological fact that it takes both a man and a woman to produce a child, social reality that children deserve both a mother and a father. Um, those are secular truths. Uh, those aren't revealed truths, or they aren't just revealed truths. Uh, those are things that anyone who has thought about the human condition could recognize. We're male and female. The union of a man and a woman can produce a child. Children deserve a relationship with their mother and their father. The question is, how do you uh, vindicate that right of the child to have a mom and dad? You need an institution. That institution is called marriage. Marriage encourages a man and a woman to commit to each other permanently and exclusively so that any children that are created will have a mother and a father. And the government can recognize this truth about marriage and promote this truth about marriage, promote a culture in which marriage is respected, while leaving consenting adults free to live in other relationships. Uh, so defining marriage as the union of a man and a woman uh, leaves adults who want to live in other relationships, whether they're same-sex relationships or opposite-sex throuples and quartets, wed leases, all sorts of other sorts of consenting adult relationships. They're free to do so. They simply don't go by the title of marriage. They simply don't have a government marriage license. This was kind of the compromise, live and let live solution. Um, but now we've had the courts overturn marriage. And the question now becomes, well, what will the consequences be? Um, in, uh, well, I forget which chapter, but I go through a couple of these. One is that what we see today is that the problems of marriage, and this is really what I try to stress several times in the book, started 50 years ago. And the problems with marriage are not the results of gays and lesbians. Gays and lesbians are not to blame for the breakdown of the marriage culture in the United States. Heterosexuals are. Heterosexuals who bought into a bad liberal ideology about human sexuality. It comes out of the sexual revolution. It comes out of the 60s. Um, this is an understanding of human sexuality that says consenting adults should do whatever consenting adults want to do. Uh, this is an understanding, a cultural understanding, that gave us the hookup culture, that gave us the rise of non-marital childbearing, gave us the rise of divorce, gave us the uh, uh, new no-fault divorce laws, rise of cohabitation. The problem here um, is that if you think those developments have been good, then by all means cheer on the logical extension of formally and legally redefining marriage. If you think those changes in the past 40 or 50 years have been bad for the family, bad for America, bad for social mobility, bad for poverty, bad for children, bad for women, bad for communities as a whole, why would you want to double down by enshrining that vision in law? And that's what just took place. Um, Justice Kennedy took the vision of human sexuality that comes out of the 60s. Uh, the love equals love. Love makes a family. Marriage should last as long as the love lasts. Consenting adults should do whatever consenting adults want to do. And he legally enshrined it in our law. And the point here is that the legal redefinition of marriage can only take place when and where it does after a cultural redefinition of marriage. Um, that it was a cultural redefinition of marriage that primed the pump for the Supreme Court to do what it's now done. It doesn't make it right, but it does explain that our response need to, needs to be much more comprehensive than just being concerned about same-sex marriage. Our response needs to be a concern about marriage, a concern about marriage writ large. Um, and so what do we do to help uh, Americans understand what marriage is and why it matters and how to live it out? When Moynihan, Senator Moynihan, wrote his famous report um, on the African-American family 50 years ago, um, he pointed out that births to single mothers were in the single digits for America as a whole, but they were approaching 25% for African Americans. And he said, this is really gonna spell destruction for those communities and those children. He was roundly criticized for being a racist. Even though he was a liberal senator from New York, he had been a liberal professor at Harvard. Uh, and it was precisely because he did care about African Americans that he wrote the report. He saw that the breakdown of the family would have these consequences. 
50 years later, we know that now 40% of all children are born to single mothers, 50% of Hispanic children, and over 70% of African Americans. Gays and lesbians aren't to blame for that. Heterosexuals are. Heterosexuals who bought into that Hollywood sexual revolution understanding about uh, marriage and the family. The problem is that the legal redefinition of marriage won't make things better, it'll make things worse. Um, how will we insist that those fathers are essential when the law has now redefined marriage to make fathers optional? How do we insist that every child has a natural right to both a mother and a father when the Supreme Court has just redefined marriage to say that two moms or two dads is the same thing as a mom and a dad? When they say that men and women are interchangeable and therefore mothers and fathers are replaceable? Um, the, the law functions as a teacher, and over time the law will shape our culture, our culture will shape our beliefs, and then our beliefs will shape our actions. And as more and more Americans come to believe that marriage is simply about consenting adult romance, more and more Americans will live out their own families in this way. And you see people criticizing Ashley Madison, um, not because adultery is wrong, but because deception is wrong. And so they point out there's another uh, website, I believe it's called OpenSecrets.com, or um, it's a it's a it's an adultery website where both spouses sign up. And the idea here, there was a New York Times profile of the gay activist Dan Savage, and he said one of the things that straight couples can learn from gay couples is the virtue of the open relationship. Um, so the romantic caregiving part is between two people, but the sexual part can include others, provided there's no deception provided it's honest and open, there's no reason why marriage should be limited to two partners in a sexually uh, a faithful relationship. The, the article was titled, Married, comma, with Infidelities. And this was in the New York Times Sunday Magazine. Dan Savage is one of the most prominent LGBT activists in the United States. It's not a fringe argument. He was saying, and the word he coined was monogamish, a union of two people, but it's a play on the word monogamous. It's a sexually open relationship. And on a certain understanding of marriage, where marriage is mainly about romance and caregiving, it makes a certain amount of sense as to why you could be free to fulfill your sexual desires with other people. He was even saying it could enhance your romantic caregiving relationship with your uh, marriage partner if that one person wasn't required to fulfill all of your sexual needs. That was his argument. A couple years later, the Washington Post uh, ran a piece uh, introducing me to the word wed lease a play on the word wedlock. Uh, this argument was, look, so many marriages already end in divorce. Why don't we just issue wed leases, a temporary marriage license, a five or a 10 year marriage contract, which you could renew on good behavior. Again, gays and lesbians aren't to blame for that. Um, it comes out of a sexual revolution vision in which marriage should last as long as the love lasts. The problem is that it's that same vision of what marriage is that Justice Kennedy has just enshrined in our constitution. And that's going to be the challenge. How do we promote and live out the truth about marriage in a culture and legal system that is now teaching a lie about marriage? That's teaching it's mainly about consenting adult romance. Um, let me say one, one other thing um, about the book, and then I will uh, take your questions. One of the things that I tried to learn for this third um, lesson of the pro-life movement was, well, what happened um, to, for pro-lifers to make the case? And one thing I found is that, one, they found better spokespeople. Uh, we found groups like Feminists for Life, Silent No More, Women Speak for Themselves. Uh, various groups, uh, Silent No More, women who had um, had an abortion, regretted that decision, said that they had it because they thought it would solve their problems, and instead it made things worse. And they were now sharing their story. Feminists for Life pointing out that all of the original feminists, Susan B. Anthony, and there's also the Susan B. Anthony list that I should mention, right? These groups were re reminding feminists that modern feminism has actually betrayed women and that the founders of the feminist movement thought that abortion was a crime against both women and children. Um, so making that argument. Women Speak for Themselves was founded in the aftermath of the HHS mandate um, saying, that, look, Barbara Boxer and Nancy Pelosi don't speak for all women, and let's have some women speak for themselves who uh, support what their churches teach on these issues. I think very similarly, we will want to find uh, spokespeople on the marriage issue. Uh, in chapter seven, I tell the story of several now adults who were children of same-sex couples. And they explain that they love their two moms. Um, they were actually in favor of same-sex marriage as teenagers and as young adults. They thought that their two moms should have a right to get married. It was only when they got married themselves and they saw their husband interacting with their children 
that they saw that fathers weren't the same thing as, as mothers. Um, one of them, uh, Heather Barwick, uh, wrote a piece that I quote from in the, in the book. Uh, she was saying that same-sex marriage creates an institution for missing parents. Uh, because with single parenting, with divorce and separated parents parenting, no one sets out as an ideal to say single parenting is the ideal. Divorce parenting is the ideal. We recognize sometimes this happens because of human frailty. Uh, because of the fall, we can't always live up to our ideals. Here's a consequence. But no one incentivizes it or encourages it or promotes it. She was pointing out that with marriage redefined, with same-sex marriage, you actually have an institution for missing parents. Um, you'll have two moms, but you'll be missing the dad. You'll have two dads, but you'll be missing the mom. And the law and the culture will be saying you're not missing anything, that this is equal to a mom and a dad. The whole language and logic of marriage equality uh, is that the spouses and therefore the parents are interchangeable. Um, this is when I really first saw that redefining marriage redefines parenting, which in turn will redefine childhood. Uh, it'll extend to the technologies that are used. Um, there's already a problem with the fact that our fertility industry is entirely unregulated. Again, gays and lesbians didn't cause that. Heterosexuals did. But redefining marriage exacerbates that problem because same-sex couples who desire a child of their own, if it's a gay male couple, one of them can provide the sperm, but they'll need to buy someone's eggs. They'll need to rent someone's womb. And so there's all the questions that come with the exploitation frequently of poor minority women in terms of surrogacy, of egg harvesting. Um, those complications are only exacerbated by redefining what marriage is because in turn it will redefine parenting. It was interesting, uh, Justice um, Kennedy's third point in his majority opinion, he said one of the reasons why marriage needs to be redefined is that marriage is attached to the rights to parent, procreate, and raise a family. And the question becomes, well, wait, when the court has said that there's a right to procreate, parent, and raise a family, it was precisely because the union of a man and a woman can procreate and can unite children with mom and dad. If you're now extending that logic to the same-sex couple, how do you uh, fulfill their right to procreate and parent? Well, we kind of have an answer to that from California. Like when California implemented Obamacare, it said that all health care plans had to cover fertility treatments for all couples, including same-sex couples. And so you can see here how if you're a same-sex couple, you try to conceive and it's not happening naturally, you would resort to an assisted reproductive technology. And in California, it was irrespective of the conscientious beliefs of uh, the health care providers, of the insurance companies. All health care plans had to cover these uh, fertility treatments. So if there's a contraception mandate, there's also a conception mandate. These are some of the consequences that over time will play out. And so what I try to do is say that pro-lifers found better spokespeople. We can find better spokespeople. I also point um, to people like Bobby Lopez and Doug Mainwaring. Bobby Lopez is himself a bisexual. He was raised by two moms. He's been very courageous in speaking out against the redefinition of marriage. Doug Mainwaring is a gay man who wrote an essay for public discourse titled, I'm Gay and I'm Against Gay Marriage. And he was just explaining that it wasn't right for him to deprive his children of both a mother and a father. And so he had left his wife. He subsequently reconciled with his wife, and they're trying to raise their children together. Uh, these are stories that people need to hear. I think most Americans aren't familiar with any of these names, any of these stories, and they think that there's one side to this debate. Uh, the media has been very good with promoting Zach Walls and his story. It hasn't been as good of telling Katie Faust or Heather Barwicks or Bobby Lopez or Doug Mainwaring's story. So I try to tell those stories. In the same way, um, pro-life movement was very good of using science, um, showing that it's not just a faith-based argument. There's a rational argument to defend children. And the best of embryology, uh, the best of development of biology, the best of uh, ultrasound, vividly now we can see the unborn child in the womb. Social science will never be as uh, vivid as um, uh, 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 something that's physically kind of visible. Um, the Planned Parenthood videos are much more visceral and they uh, evoke a reaction that's much more immediate than social science statistics. But at the same time, um, I would say that someone like Mark Regneris, someone like Paul Sullins, um, those studies over time will be vindicated. Uh, that when you use large, random, representative samples, when you use the gold standard for social science methodology, uh, we will find that children flourish the best when they are raised by their married biological mothers and fathers. And the reason why I think that is that we had a 50-year consensus of social science showing just that with every other 
alternative family structure that was explored. Single parenting, cohabitation, divorce, divorce and remarriage. They had tested all of those using the rigorous social science, and they found that none of those situations provided children with the optimal setting. And they pointed to three reasons why. They said that biology matters, so having a biological connection between both parent and child. Gender matters, so having both a father and a mother. And stability matters, uh, having a stable, permanent, monogamous, exclusive relationship, which is one reason why cohabitation and divorce, and even divorce and remarriage. It's not just two incomes, not just two parents, that even those three alternatives don't produce the same outcomes. So the question here is, why would we think that these early studies that use non-random, non-representative samples, the ones that the media's, media love to quote, the ones that the courts love to cite, why would we think that those studies would be the one exception to this general rule? There won't be a double biological connection between same-sex parents and their children. There won't be gender complementarity when it comes to parenting. And right now, the preliminary science suggests there won't be as much stability. And it has nothing to do with homosexuality. Uh, it tends to do with gender, uh, that a double male relationship and a double female relationship function in different ways than a male-female relationship because men and women are different. Double male relationship tends to be more promiscuous, not because gay men are, but because men are. And so when you have two men in a relationship, it will uh, exacerbate the natural male tendency. Double female relationship of the three types is the shortest lived, um, not because it has something to do with uh, homosexuality, but because women tend to be the ones that file for the majority of divorce licenses. And so when you have the double female relationship, they have a higher threshold for emotional and romantic intimacy, and romantic satisfaction. The double female relationship tends to be the shortest lived of female, female, male, male, and male, female. If that's the case, then it would also mean the stability uh, issue uh, will be less, uh, um, it'll be less stable. In which case, the three vectors, you know, why is it that marriage protects children? We know biology matters, gender matters, stability matters. It looks like we can explain why the Mark Regneris and the Paul Sullen studies came to the outcomes they came. Again, look, the science is in its infancy. Uh, my, my sense is that over time, Regneris and Sullen's will be vindicated. Um, I go through the current state of the social science literature in the seventh chapter of the book. And then I think we're just going to have to see how this plays out. But it'll be vitally important that we don't stop these investigations now. It's vitally important that good social scientists continue to study family structure using rigorous methodology um, to reveal the truth about these things. The last thing I'll add is that um, the eighth chapter of the book talks about a role for the church. I'm not a theologian. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a Bible scholar. So I can't give them concrete advice on how to make the argument. I just say this is what the need is. And I highlight four different areas, uh, a need for the church to respond. And the idea here is that when Roe v. Wade was handed down, the Southern Baptists applauded the decision. They thought Roe v. Wade was good constitutional law because they thought abortion was just a Catholic issue. Today, the Southern Baptists are the largest, most active pro-life uh, uh, church community in the United States. And it shows us that people who today might be on the wrong side of this marriage debate can change their mind and can become a force for good if we help them see it. Uh, one of the things that took place was that the Southern Baptist leaders realized that, no, abortion wasn't just a Catholic thing. It was a human rights thing, and that it was wrong uh, for the unelected judges to strike down these laws protecting unborn children. And today, because of Dr. Richard Land and now because of Dr. Russell Moore, uh, the SBC and the ERLC are leaders of the pro-life movement. The same thing can happen for some of the church communities that have gone wrong on the marriage issue. Uh, we have to help them see that they've made a mistake. Additionally, the church in general needs to find a way to uh, respond to the sexual revolution. Again, the challenge here isn't just same-sex marriage. The challenge here is that a majority of young people are having their intellects and their moral imagination formed more by Hollywood uh, than by the truth. And so one thing here that the challenge will be is how do we communicate to the next generation a vision of the family um, that's compelling, that's attractive um, in a culture and a legal culture that says the truth has been overruled. Uh, and so with that, I'll stop. And it looks like we have about 15 minutes uh, for questions. Yes, Dr. Fagan. Oh, they're bringing you a microphone. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful lecture and, and for your book. Um, a question that's been on my mind for a while, the use of 
language is key here. And the redefinition of marriage, which the court has done, is not the courts to do. Yep. That is robbery. Uh, it's highway robbery of a concept that isn't theirs, it's humanities. So a proposal, hmm. I don't, something along this line, that we in the pro-family movement start using related terms, but keep marriage for what it always was. Mm. So we might call, and this is to be worked out, but something like, if you're talking about gay marriage, you call it garage, instead of a mar garage instead of marriage. If it's lesbian, uh, marriage, larage. <laughs> <laughs> or if you want a generic homosexual marriage, it's harage. But getting these words into use, I think, is key. Because they, and that will take time, but whoever holds the language ultimately yep. holds the whole game. And to concede the word marriage is, to a large extent, not totally, obviously, is to concede a huge amount of uh, the playing field. Yeah. Um on the broader point, I think you're exactly right, which is one reason why I don't talk about defending traditional marriage. I talk about marriage, and I try to not use modifiers or adjectives in front of marriage. Uh, what I'm talking about is the reality of marriage, and then I say other people are trying to redefine marriage. Uh, they're trying to say marriage is something other than what it is. My only concern with the three uh, terms um, that you suggest is how will that be heard by other people? And you know, my biggest concern, when, especially whenever I'm doing um, public speaking or media on this, is trying to reach the audience where they are. And, you know, normally I'm not speaking to a friendly audience. Normally I'm on a college campus, a law school. Uh, next week I'll be at Harvard's law school. I'll be speaking to a largely hostile audience. Last night I was on CNN. They, the viewers weren't inclined to agree with me. And so it, if my fear is that if I was to use terms like that, I would immediately lose my audience and they wouldn't be um, open to hearing the other points that I think they could be. I mean, and I think our biggest challenge right now will be how do we have the honorable, fair-minded, reasonable liberals who might disagree with us about marriage um, agree with us about the liberty question, agree with us about the freedom question. Um, because if we can't convince them, if they go with the activists and the ideologues on the left-hand side of the equation, then we just have an intractable culture war for the foreseeable future. Um, and so that would be my only concern, is that, and I think it's always going to be audience-specific. You know, you try to reach your audience where they are. Yeah, in the back corner. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I apologize for being late. There was an incident down the street, and a senior citizen fell and, and hurt himself um, badly, so I had to call 911. But thank you all for letting me in. Uh, my name is Pastor Gaines. I'm also an attorney. I attended a meeting a, a few years ago uh, that was hosted by um, Alliance Defending Freedom. Mm -hmm. And at that time, they were 100% sure that the black church would not give in mm -hmm. to this notion of gay marriage. And they felt that the black church would be the buffer, if you would, against what was happening in, uh, in the you know, common culture of our, of our country. Uh, but that has not panned out, as we can see. So my question is, how does an organization like this, I get all the emails, I support the initiatives, I, I try to get other people to sign the petitions and do a number of things that, that support what we really believe. Um, how does an organization like this interface better, or even ADF, and I'll be talking yeah. to them as well, interface better with the black church? Because I still do believe, for the most part, uh, the black church does still hold the traditional values. I think what... Uh, you don't like the modifiers, but uh, marriage needs to remain as God had purposed it to, re to be from the beginning of time. Uh, so, I mean, my question is, how do we better engage one another? I, I, I am the only, looks like, African-American attendee in the room, uh, black attendee in the room. I don't, I don't care about the, the titles <laughs> so much. <laughs> but, but the reality of yeah. how do we work together better yeah. and, and get this message out and, and ally, you yeah. know, Okay. No, that's a great question. Um, I think I have two thoughts. Uh, the first thought in response is, um, I think you said it really well towards the end when you said, you still think the black church believes the truth about marriage. Um, I can't speak to this directly, but my sense is that some of the kind of official leaders of the black community aren't actually in step with 
black Americans um, and that the Reverend Al Sharpton, the Reverend Al Jesse Jackson, they don't really speak for you or for your community. Um, that's my sense here. And so one question would be like, you know, you, you can see this, uh, think about this in a political context, so not like a church context, but a lot of uh, conservatives felt that the Republican leadership wasn't speaking for them. And so the Tea Party has started. And now you have this like this big splinter between the establishment and the anti-establishment and Ted Cruz being at war with uh, um, uh, Mitch McConnell and those sorts of things. Does something similar need to happen if um, if the official civil rights leaders of the NAACP and of associated kind of um, uh, 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 African-American, black American groups aren't really representing uh, the people. Um, How do we get them out? Yeah, no, I mean, and, and that's the question. Um, so I mean, that, but that would just, one thing would be what would need to happen to change that dynamic? And maybe it needs to be a grassroots movement that someone like you leads, right? Because I can't lead that movement, but um, someone uh, who feels the same frustration you feel could do that. Um, on the second uh, uh, question, the point that I want to say in response is that um, I saw that Dr. Moore, Russell Moore, for the um, Ethics and Religious Liberty, Religious Liberty Commission or the Southern Baptist Convention, just a few weeks ago had a, um, a large meeting on racial reconciliation in the gospel. And it was partly in response to the riots in Ferguson, the shootings uh, in South Carolina. Um, and he wanted to say, well, there, there, there are problems here, right? We, we need to find a way to overcome uh, the legacy of racism, some of the remnants of that even today. Um, what I, I would try to learn from someone like Dr. Moore as to what is working. Um, when you say, well, how can we have better engagement? Um, I would look to them. I mean, think, think the history of the Southern Baptist Convention um, is not always uh, perfect uh, on racial issues, and yet now they're engaged in this racial reconciliation project. What would be the parallel for a political movement? You know, how, how do we make it so that you're not the only person of color in the room um, the next time a lecture like this takes place? Um, and I think we probably have as much to learn from you than as anything I could say uh, in response to your question. Other questions? Yep. I'm uh, Chris Kasich, I'm a senior fellow here at the Family Research Council. Um, this is more narrow, it's about Kim Davis. And I was just wondering about your impression about what's happening uh, in the last couple of days. One of the things that's happened is that as she's been you know, sort of crushed by all of the, you know, the smart people, right, um, who basically, I mean, they've never heard of anyone like, you know, Abraham Lincoln. No one ever opposed the, uh, you know, Plessy versus Ferguson. I mean, we all just roll over and just, you know, bow, down, bow down before Anthony Kennedy because he is the font of all human wisdom in America, okay? Um, but... So, you know, you go on the, the supposedly conservative television network and they just crush her. Um, but one of the things that's interesting to me about this is that, the, that there's been a sort of a, oh, you know, she works for the government. You know, everyone who works for the government has to do X and Y and Z. But there's also been this sort of growing sort of sense that, that people are realizing, if I don't work for the government, then you can't tell me what to do. And I think sort of the, the flip side of this is, that the bakers and the photographers, I think they're gaining a lot of space out of this. Do you get a sense of that? Yeah, I mean, so it's been interesting to me, and I, I had meant to open with Davis and then loop back to close that, that loop at the end of the lecture, and I just forgot, but um, what's it? <laughs> thank you, thank you. That's what, that's, yeah. Um, so uh, to me, it's what's been interesting is to see that um, people are now arguing that religious liberty is just for the private sector, um, which I think is a mistake. Uh, religious liberty is for all sectors uh, in the United States. We have a rich history of accommodating uh, people of faith um, when it came to the draft. Uh, so postal workers who had objections to delivering or processing draft cards, IRS workers who had objections to processing the paperwork for nonprofits that were for supporting causes that they objected to. And what we said was that it is legally required, for example, under the Civil Rights Act to create reasonable accommodations that do not create undue burdens on employers, both in private employment and in public employment. So the postal workers, the IRS officials, uh, it was a vegetarian bus driver who was told she was supposed to pass out coupons to a burger place and she objected to that and they accommodated her. Where did we, how did we get to a situation in which we say, either do every last aspect of your job, even if one small minor part of it you object to, or resign, choose between your faith and your livelihood. Um, and people seem to have forgotten that, you know, there's a third possibility here of reasonable accommodations. 
And so it's been striking to me to see, um, I wrote an op-ed in Monday's New York Times, Today the Letters Ran. All of the letters in response um, ignore the history of religious accommodations for public employees. They simply say, well, religious liberty is just about the private sector. Um, but I think you might be right. This might be creating more space for the baker, the florist, and the photographer. Because up until this point, what we had heard was that religious liberty is just for the pastor and the priest. Um, so think about this. The last time that we uh, um, were in a situation of trying to defend someone in the public square, like Hobby Lobby, we were told, no, it's freedom to worship. And that the owners of Hobby Lobby have a right to pray how they want to pray. They can go to the church of their choice, but they can't run their business in accordance with their beliefs. Um, and so maybe you're right that, that, that this has actually created some progress, that, that now at least um, people are being more uh, liberty friendly for when you people in the commercial sphere. A suggestion. So when, you know, if they're not listening up there, okay. <laughs> um, no, I mean, you, you get into this, so they're going to crush Kim Davis, right? Okay, so they crush her. But you, you get into this discussion, I say, but you do agree that the baker shouldn't have to do this, right? I'd just like to see the reaction, yeah. you know, the, the, you know it, there's, there's expression in making a cake, right, in these sorts of things. And that's where I think we'll split the reasonable liberal from the ideologue and the activist. Um, I think the reasonable liberal is going to say, I personally would bake the cake, but I don't think um, – Sweet cakes by Melissa should be forced by the government under a $135,000 fine to bake the cake. I think it's the ideologue who's going to say, no, if you open a business, you have to serve every client regardless of your beliefs. You have to do every order regardless of your beliefs. Um, because if you think about this, they weren't objecting to serving every client. They had no problem serving gay and lesbian customers. And Baron L. Stutzman, the 70-year-old florist, had gay employees and had served this particular gay couple for a decade. Their only objection was to the same-sex wedding, to baking the cake to help celebrate the same-sex wedding, to doing the flowers for the same-sex wedding, to taking the pictures. Uh, and I think the reasonable liberal will agree with us on this. Um, and that's why I think the more and more the facts get out about these stories, the better it goes. The difficult case is halfway between Kim Davis and the Baker Flores and the photographer. What about a religious school? Should it keep its accreditation? Should it keep it nonprofit tax status? Should it keep government subsidized student loans? What about a charity? What about Catholic Charities Adoption Agency? Uh, should it keep its license? Should it keep its nonprofit tax status? Should it keep its government funding? And because here you kind of have this mixture of public and private. Um, the vast majority of our civil society institutions are this way. Almost none of them are wholly private. They're all entangled with the government some way, shape, or form. It's not their fault. It's because government has overgrown so much that when you overtax the citizenry and then you hand out grants to various civil society groups, it's hard not to be entangled with that. You can't run a major research university right now without receiving federal funding for science. It's almost impossible. To, and this is why I think Hillsdale College, Grove City, and a third school – are the only three schools that don't receive any government money. So try running your faith-based university or college uh, without government money. It's very difficult. Only three are doing it. But even then, you still need government accreditation, and you need your nonprofit tax status. Because if you're not giving government money, you need donor money. And if they remove your nonprofit tax status, it'll make it much harder to raise it. That's where we're going to need to, again, get to the point that provided you are not engaged in direct tangible harm to the fabric of civil society, there's no reason why the government should be coercing you in this. Um, so there's a reason why we think um, that certain groups shouldn't be funded by the government, neo-Nazis, racists, believing that we're created male and female and that male and female are created for each other in marriage are not like those extremist groups. And so it's perfectly reasonable that Catholic charities should be free to take care of orphans according to its understanding. Uh, Wheaton College should be free to educate students according to its understanding, and there should be no government penalties on any of these issues. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. I will, you just answered. Oh, great. Oh, I answered your question. Perfect. I anticipated it. <laughs> I just really just wanted to kind of say again, when when examples like Plessy and Dred Scott are lifted for the African American community, the black community, the people of color, it, it's almost offensive because again, what the Supreme Court has done is crafted behavior based civil rights, hmm. behavior based civil rights, as opposed to something like uh, race or ethnicity. And so if, if the conversation could be even at Harvard, pointed mm -hmm. back to that distinction, because what you've just elicited is, is, a, is, is a whole host of problems 
that yeah. are going to uh, arise, you know, that we're soon going to have to de uh, deal with, you know, f from every uh, uh, religious-based or other kind of conscientious group that has uh, an issue with the behavior being protected. And so, and that's a slippery slope, as yep. we all can see, because what's the next behavior that is going to be entitled to civil rights protections? And so if you could somehow separate that yep. conversation from race, uh, which is what they've co-opted and been very successful at doing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I think that might get the yep. thinking person back to the place of being able to hear some of the arguments that you're yeah. making. I mean, gr great question, um, great observation. Chapter six of the book is titled, Why Sexual Orientation is Not Like Race. And it's exactly addressing, it takes about 30 pages to spell this all out, both historically, philosophically, and theologically. Um, to summarize, I think Martin Luther King Jr. got it exactly right when he said his dream was that his children would be judged by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. And we can see, what is the principle he's articulating? There's a distinction between action and non-action characteristics. Your skin color tells you nothing about your actions, nothing about your character. Your actions are what make up your character, right? The types of actions, the virtues and vices. And so it's reasonable for people to make judgments about action. It's not reasonable for people to make judgments about skin color. Um, that's the shortest kind of way. We have a history of the United States of enslaving people based on their skin color. Then we had a history of segregating people based on their skin color. It makes sense why the government had to undo several hundred years of injustice that the government perpetrated. It's not clear now why we have to force a baker to bake a cake for a same-sex couple. Like the, the false equivalency there um, is insulting. You're right. I mean, like to, 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 for people to draw that false equivalency, I quote um, Jackie Rivers. Um, she did her PhD in African American studies at Harvard. She's now a postdoc there. Um, her husband, uh, Eugene Rivers, is a pastor in uh, the Church of God in Christ, Kojic, um, black church leader. Um, she gave a great talk at the Vatican uh, back in November. It was a global interfaith summit. I think they had. Um, something like 30 different religions represented from all of the continents. And they all disagree about everything about the nature of God, and yet all of them agreed marriage is the union of male and female. And it was pointing out that there was this global interfaith consensus on the male-female part of marriage, even when they disagree about Trinitarian theology, Christology, soteriology, all sorts of things. And she pointed out how the hijacking of the civil rights legacy um, to her as a black woman um, was so offensive. And so I quote her on this because, again, it's it's – it's, it's the type of thing that the media is not um, uh, portraying. They're not presenting. They're not giving her uh, um, some of the coverage that I think she deserves. And so I try to give voice to these people in the book. Thank you. Well, I just want to thank everybody for their very thoughtful questions. And uh, Ryan, I think you can hang around for just a few minutes. Yep. So if anybody wants to speak to you personally, uh, let's thank Ryan. Great. Thank you.